After multiple false alarms, Apple's new and improved processors are finally here, and with them new MacBook Pros. Their original laptop chip, the M1, was already something of an engineering marvel, so how should you expect the new M1 Pro and M1 Max to perform? Welcome to a mini episode of our explainer show Upscaled. It's going to be a little while before we're able to get our hands on one of Apple's new MacBook Pros, but we wanted to fill you in on what's going on with these new chips. Apple is promising some pretty big things, if you can afford them that is. The first M1 chip paired four high powered and four power efficient cores together with a 7 or 8 core GPU. Now with those specs, the 13 inch M1 powered MacBook Pro was able to handily beat an 8 core 16 inch Intel powered MacBook Pro in most of our tests, and in a few tests was nearly as powerful as a 16-core AMD-powered desktop. The new M1 Pro and Max come with eight of those high-powered cores and two power-efficient ones, along with a 16, 24, or 32-core GPU. With twice the high-powered cores and more than twice the power draw, expect the CPU side of these new chips to fly. And with up to four times as many GPU cores, the graphics improvements should be even bigger. In addition to these, there is also a base model of the 14-inch MacBook Pro with six high-powered and two low-powered cores and a 14-core GPU. But that looks like it's going to be in the realm of not worth the money, so I'd probably recommend you skip it. The RAM limitations of the M1, which capped out at 16 gigabytes, are gone as well, with the Pro supporting up to 32 gigabytes of memory and the Max up to 64. You will need to pay for it though, with Apple charging a ridiculous $400 for that first extra 16 gigabytes or $800 for the full 64. A note on that, as someone with 128 gigabytes of RAM in my desktop, the 16 gig limit on the original M1 made me pretty nervous, though we never actually ran into any problems with it during our testing. My editor does have issues with the 8 gigs in his MacBook Air though. The new M1 Pro and Max do have much faster memory bandwidth though, 200 gigabytes a second on the Pro and 400 gigabytes a second on the Max, and that can do a lot to offset any problems you might have with not having enough memory. Still, when we did our testing, a lot of famously RAM-hungry programs like Adobe After Effects and DaVinci Resolve weren't natively supported on the M1 yet, and I would be curious to see how those programs perform on these new chips. I expect most pros will spring for the 32 gigabytes, which is probably why Apple is charging a whole $400 for that piddling extra 16 gigs. And if I had to guess, I would bet that at these speeds, 99% of programs will show no benefits going from 32 to 64 gigs of memory. For a little context here, some recent leaks suggest that Intel's upcoming Alder Lake desktop chips paired with super fast cutting edge DDR5 memory will get bandwidth speeds of about 90 gigabytes a second. More so than in years, Apple really seems to be positioning these computers as true pro machines not just laptops for college kids with extra money. They've really been focusing on the ability of these computers to do things like 3D rendering and data analysis and things like, say, playing back multiple 8K video streams. But I see another potential use here. In our tests with the original 13-inch M1 MacBook Pro, game compatibility was a little bit of a problem. There were very few games at the time which natively supported the M1 chip, and Rosetta, Apple's tool for getting Intel software translated to run on their M1 machines, while generally very solid, had some issues with game performance and compatibility. The situation is a bit better today. There are more games with native M1 support, including Disco Elysium and World of Warcraft, and far more games can work through Rosetta. When we first tested the 13-inch M1 MacBook Pro, we found that the game Divinity Original Sin 2 actually ran perfectly on it. I'd been playing the game on my 16-inch MacBook Pro, and it worked well, but it drained the battery and made the system run hot. On the 13-inch MacBook Pro, the game ran just as well, but kept the system so cool and quiet, I actually did not realize that computer had a fan in it. Seriously, we had to go back and re-edit that video because I missed it. That computer only had eight GPU cores, and you can now get a Mac MacBook Pro with 32 of them. Bizarrely, this means the 16-inch MacBook Pro may now be the fastest gaming laptop out there. Add in a 120Hz refresh rate screen with HDR support, and you have what could be a great gaming laptop. If only Apple still supported Boot Camp. Apple loves to give performance figures only in ratios, and it can be hard to pull exact numbers out of their charts. But in one of their examples, the comparison system they're using is an 8-core Razer Blade 15 laptop with an NVIDIA 3080 GPU. 
We got out our protractors, and based on the chart, Apple seems to be saying that their 32-core M1 Max GPU will be faster at about 55 watts of power than a 95-watt NVIDIA 3080 mobile chip. This seems to suggest a peak power draw of about 85 watts for the CPU and GPU together of a fully specced out M1 Max. And remember, a desktop 3080 can draw 350 watts of power by itself. Now, 85 watts isn't insane for a fast machine. Plenty of high-performance PC laptops use 100 watts or more when gaming. But one of the things we loved about the original M1 laptops was how cool and quiet they were even under load. These new laptops will probably run hotter when you stress them, and they have bigger fans. 85 watts is just a fair amount of heat to deal with, but there is still a lot to be seen about how Apple handles fan noise, power, heat, and battery life. Apple says the 100 watt hour batteries in the 16-inch MacBook Pro should get you an impressive 21 hours of video playback. Though we would expect the really serious creative work they're targeting with these machines will still drain that battery in two to three hours. Also, while you actually can kit out the smaller 14-inch MacBook Pro with the same high-powered hardware as its bigger sibling, expect its smaller 70-watt-hour battery to not last very long at all under full power. Of course, none of this is going to come cheap. The least expensive of these machines, the new 14-inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro with only the six high-powered and two low-powered core chip will still start at $2,000. To get a 16-inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Max, 32 GPU cores, and 32 gigs of RAM is going to cost a whopping $3,300. And if you want the full 64 gigabytes of RAM and say a two terabyte hard drive, you're looking at $4,300. Pro indeed. We won't have to wait long at all to get a sense of just how fast these computers are and whether they are at all worth it for the price. Engadget's full review of these new MacBook Pros should be arriving soon, and then maybe we'll be able to get our hands on one of these machines for a little bit of upscale testing. Stay tuned for that, and we'll catch you next time.